because appointment processes are so fundamentally broken, none of these institutions can guard against appointment processes being fundamentally broken. And you go down this vicious cycle uh, of, of just, you know, spiraling uh, corruption and, and maladministration. And Is South Africa's judiciary safe from cadre deployment and state capture? I posed this question to Leon Schreiber in a recent episode of my podcast, Solutions with David Ansara. What follows is a short extract from our longer conversation. You can watch the full interview that's linked in the description below. Enjoy. Uh, so do you think that our judiciary is under threat from cadre deployment? I think there's no doubt about that. I mean, it's, it's black on white in those minutes. Um, so I think the point, though, is that we th this should heighten the urgency of of getting this of getting this done because I don't think it has reached the point yet where uh, you know we wouldn't feel confident taking this case to court, um, but there's clearly a very real risk that uh, that this may happen in future, and so we need to essentially uh, firewall the judiciary now on the understanding that there is a clear assault going on not only from the Zuma years, these minutes are from the time that Ramaphosa has been president. Um, and he clearly finds nothing wrong with the idea that uh, his deployment committee would sit and decide uh, who should become judges in the constitutional court. Absolutely outrageous and and, and unacceptable uh, to, to any Democrat. So, you know, uh, I think we have a limited window still of actually implementing these reforms because there is still uh, uh, some independence, sufficient independence in the judiciary. But I, don't, I think you'd be fooling yourself to think that if the governing party is interfering with, <laughs> with appointments to the courts in this way that you can go on forever like this. You clearly can't. And so I think it, it, it only serves to heighten the urgency of this case. Um, and I, I think the, you mean, the, the other point you make about interference with Chapter 9 institutions uh, that are supposed to be independent, you know, this is, this is exactly the problem, that uh, because appointment processes are so fundamentally broken, None of these institutions can guard against appointment processes being fundamentally broken. And you go down this vicious cycle uh, of, of just, you know, spiraling uh, corruption and, and maladministration. And that's, uh, that's why it is a historic pity, in my view, that the Public Service Commission had its teeth pulled in the 1990s. I mean, if you look at the interim constitution, the Public Service Commission had uh, quite substantial powers to uh, enforce fair appointment processes, but it really was neutered. Uh, and in the final constitution, uh, it doesn't have the kind of powers you want it to have. And certainly in the public service, uh, in the Public Service Commission Act, the piece of legislation that governs the PSC, um, it it has nowhere near the kind of independence or or powers that 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 it should have. So uh, yes, there is a very real risk. But I think that makes it, that is not something uh, in terms of the judiciary that should discourage us. It should actually uh, force us to hurry up and get this done and make sure that this kind of interference does not continue in the future to make sure that the judiciary itself is protected um, uh, from cater deployment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that is really one of the key revelations that's come out of this process is that uh, not even the constitutional court is immune. And Kwede Mantash, the Minerals and Energy Minister, he was quoted as saying, well, look, you know, cadre employ deployment is important for transformation purposes. Uh, and if you go back and study some of the original documents from the 80s, uh, the ANC under Oliver Tambo was saying, look, you know, we're going to be faced with this uh, all white male civil service. We need to make it more racially representative. But in my view, uh, this language of transformation and equity has been used to uh, drive through political appointees and uh, often people who are not appointed on merit. So there seems to me to be a relationship there between BE and cadre deployment. Mm -hmm. So uh, hypothetically, if you you were successful in defeating cadre deployment and BE still existed, would we still see some of the same problems manifesting? Uh, I think there's just one, one, one earlier point to make on, on this argument from Antashe, and it's got a fatal weakness. The, and that is the fact that the Constitution and the Public Service Act and, and all the other legislation governing uh, employment practices already requires uh, that the public service is broadly representative. So there are already legal instruments in place to 
attain the goal that Mantashe uh, suggests Cater deployment is, is trying to, to attain. And so there's no need for another layer of, of especially political party interference if what you're trying to achieve is uh, something that's already set out in law. The irony, of course, is that uh, because the ANC only looks at representation in terms of race, and we know this, uh, the, the, they miss the reality that the public service has become vastly unrepresentative of South Africa because the public service looks more like the ANC than it does like South Africa. The people who are at the top, the managers, the, the board members, they are not representative of the people of South Africa and certainly not of the skills that we have in South Africa. What they represent is the pool of ANC cadres because that is what the system was set up to reflect. And so in that sense, <laughs> the great irony is that the ANC has made the public service profoundly unrepresentative uh, of, of South Africa. And perhaps even in that sense, uh, too, has violated the constitution uh, because representation certainly cannot only be limited to the idea of, of skin color. I think that the point about BEE is an important one as well. Um, I do think that if we, you know, if we win this case and, and we get the kind of orders we are looking for against cater deployment, it would be very difficult to use the existing BE legislation as some kind of replacement for deployment, because what we're talking about with cater deployment is, is actually a mechanism. It's a committee of 11 members that get together in those smoke-filled back rooms at Lutuli House and says, appoint person X and person Y and person Z in these different institutions. Um, so that is a mechanical practice that we hope to outlaw and abolish. So you can't then go and create the same committee again, uh, uh, you know, e even if you talk about BE legislation, because that practice uh, would be abolished. And mind you, it would ex extend beyond the ANC, because it's about the principle here that no party should be able to do this. Um, and so I think it would be difficult um, to sneak it in in that way. But there is a bigger question about BE. And here I raise something that uh, really still, <laughs> after all these years of this, uh, managed to shock me quite a bit, was that President Ramaphosa said in his court papers that cater deployment is also practiced in the private sector. And this was, in my view, an incredible revelation. Uh, he, 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 in a section of his court papers, funded again by you and me and other taxpayers, um, set out a, a case of what ANC cadre deployment supposedly is. And in the section where he describes the different institutions that are subject to deployment, he explicitly says that leadership positions in the private sector are also discussed and decided at the deployment committee. Now, now that makes that opens up a whole new uh, kettle of fish because mm. um, what we had known in the public domain for many years was the impact on the public sector and the idea that the, the ANC wanted to capture and control the levers of state. But if we have a situation now, and, and I'm in the process of probing uh, what the reality is behind Ramaphosa's statement, which he made under oath, by the way, um, of the private sector actually also being subject to this. So what it conjures with me is the idea that you know, BE in combination with some kind of recommendation from the deployment committee uh, leads to a decision of someone who should be heading a bank or a big corporate or, you know, that that's that's how I can, and I think most reasonable people would interpret what the president said in those court papers. Um, then we're talking not about state capture, but we're actually talking about country capture here, because that would suggest that even the private sector itself, which in many ways has been surprisingly patient and, you know, willing to cooperate with the ANC in, in the stitch up of, you know, big business and, and big government and big labor, uh, perhaps we're looking at, at a piece of the puzzle that explains why that relationship is so overly cozy in many cases. But like I say, this is something that, that I'm probing at the moment. We'll get more information out to the public as soon as we can. But I think that is a very important piece of the puzzle. Uh, if you want to also understand BEE and its links with the ANC and why it is actually elite empowerment more than anything else. This may be a big part of the answer. Thanks for watching. Let's hand over to you, our audience. Do you think South Africa's judiciary is truly independent? 
leave your thoughts down in the comments section below. Also, if you enjoyed this analysis, you might want to check out the full-length interview with Leon Schreiber. That's linked over here. You can also subscribe to my other channel. That's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.